Then we get into the small intestine. And then it even gets in the small intestine and the large intestine, and it even gets more interesting because we have all these little beasties that are living inside of us that are helping us. So this is called your normal flora, or what the new term is, your microbiota. So your new, this flora that lives in your gut has hundreds of millions of different organisms that work symbiotically with us. That means they help us absorb different nutrition, they help us digest different things, and they help fight infection. So this is your second line of defense against foodborne pathogens. So H. pylori is actually, there are certain strains of H. pylori that are normal in your flora. So in the right balance, everything in its right balance, even E. coli. Oh, I had an E. coli infection, I was really sick. E. coli is normal in your flora, in the right balance. So remember, when we talk about health and sickness and even things that I'll talk about today, we talk about, oh, this is bad and this is good. But in reality, there's not really bad or good. It's bad or good when it gets out of balance. So is inflammation bad? Oh, yes, inflammation is bad. Well, wait a second. A Th1 response to kill off a pathogen produces inflammation. That's not bad. Well, I guess it's not bad there. So there's not so much bad or good, it's, it's the concentration that we're really talking about. It's that imbalance that we're talking about. An imbalance in our gut flora, we could say, causes mm, a huge percentage of disease. At least it's present in a huge percentage of disease. Whichever came first, we don't fully know, but this is a big, big player. If we don't rebalance the gut flora, we're gonna have all sorts of problems. Because the gut flora does a lot of things to keep us healthy. So normally what happens is that we consume food and if we're consuming a good diet, and we talk about alkalizing our tissue. So what's the best way to alkalize our tissue besides using a Rife machine, which is an electron donor, which will alkalize the tissue directly, is eating a good diet. So we're eating greens, we're eating vegetables, we're eating organically. And by doing that, it's, it's allowing our body to produce alkalinity, raising the pH of tissues. Well, how does it exactly do that? Well, this, picture right here, I don't know if my pointer works, it doesn't work on this thing. So that, that line of cells right there is your epithelial cells in your intestinal wall. Your intestinal wall cells are actually a single layer of cells that go around your intestinal wall. And if you can think of them as your skin. So many times we think of when we eat something, it's inside of our body, but actually it's not really inside of our body until we absorb it. So just like our skin is a protective layer so that we don't get bacteria into our body, it's a, it's a layer that keeps things, I can stick my hand in a thing of gasoline that's not so good because I will absorb some of it, but it does keep most of the gasoline out of my bloodstream. So it is with our intestinal uh, epithelial layer, these, the cell layer that protects us from the outside world. If you can think of what's inside your gut right now, it's really in the outside world, and it'll help us understand this a little bit better. That intestinal layer is keeping things outside of us. So mercury is not good for us, right? So you shouldn't eat fish with mercury in it, right? Not a good thing. But you don't have absorption sites for mercury. So if we just think about this a second. Should we eat fish with mercury? Probably not a good idea. However, we really shouldn't absorb any of it. If I had a really healthy gut wall, I could eat fish with mercury and it would just be deposited in the toilet a few hours later. Because I don't have absorption sites for mercury. I shouldn't absorb it. The Problem comes in is that when I've damaged my gut wall, now things get across the gut wall that never should have. Remember, it's a single layer of cells. And then the, the cells are together in what's called a gap junction. In the intestinal walls, we call that a tight gap junction. And that's a perfect example because when we damage our gut wall, that tight gap junction is not so tight anymore. It starts to separate. The cells are damaged. They start to necrose. They start to balloon out. 
they start to break down and they start to have this gap in between. So things get across the gut wall that never should have got across the gut wall. Thank you.